Okay, so someone sent me this and asked me to respond to it, and that's what I'm going to do. I have removed the Protestant account that posted this. I've removed their name from the photo so as not to promote their account for people to go there and be exposed to their heresies. We are going to show that this post is false, and here's how we're going to do it. The issue starts with the way the question is posed at the top. So on their diagram, they have, must there be an infallible magisterium to interpret the infallible Bible? And they pose it this way intentionally to make it where either you end up in a circular argument from the Catholic position, or you end up with sola scriptura. This is how they try to pose the issue. The problem is the way the question's posed at the very top. It's the wrong question to start with. The question ought to be, must there be an infallible magisterium to tell us infallibly which books are inspired and which ones are not? Which belong in the Bible and which ones do not? If you answer yes, then you're on the right track. If you answer no, then you are left with relativism. And you're left with people making the assertion that the canon is maybe not closed and we should have the Gospel of Thomas in there, the Gospel of Enoch, as many say today, or you have the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientology adding in their extra divine revelation. This is what happens when you answer no. Uh, the reason why you have to answer yes is because we're trying to avoid the error of Protestant historian R.C. Sproul, who once said that what we have is a fallible list of infallible books. You know, we are saying we have an infallible list of inspired books because the church made a determination. The second problem here is when you use their diagram and go down to the bottom, it says that eventually you're left trying to interpret Acts 15, for example. And what you're trying to, you know, what the Catholic is left with is trying to interpret, you know, well, you know, what does Acts 15 mean? And they say, well, that's private interpretation, and thus you're led right back to Sola Scriptura. Here again is another error. The problem with using that argumentation is we are not interpreting Acts 15. We are reading it as historical information of what happened. This would be like somebody trying to argue, did Jesus walk on the water or did he not? Did, did St. Paul travel to Corinth or did he not? These are statements of fact, of history. They're not statements of uh, debating interpretation. We're not debating what did our Lord mean, for example, when he said you must be born again of water and the Spirit. Or we're not debating what did our Lord mean when he said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life in you. We're stating a historical fact. The historical fact is Acts 15 shows us that when there was a doctrinal dispute and a heresy had risen up, the leaders of the church met together in a council made a determination that it still stood the, te the test of time today. They laid down a dogma and they said, this seems good to us and to the Holy Ghost. That's a statement of historical fact that we find in Acts 15. The argument from the Catholic perspective is not circular as this diagram tries to show. It's not circular, it's spiral. We start by looking at the New Testament as historical writings that can be verified as true, showing us the truth about the life, the ministry, the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles. And from there we see that our Lord left a teaching church to teach with his authority, guided by the Holy Ghost to lead us into all truth. And it's that church that had successors and then in successive councils told us which books belonged in the Bible. And thus we can know with certitude which books belong there. And so if you end up with Sola Scriptura, or you end up with Protestantism in general, you end up in heresy. This is important too, because as I said at the outset, if you start with, do we need an infallible church to tell us which books belong in the Bible, and you answer no, then if that's the case, the Protestant has no certitude at all that the uh, letters, for example, the New Testament are actually inspired revelation. For that matter, you know, why not argue the Didache should be included? or the Shepherd of Hermas, or the letter of Barnabas, as many in the early church argued for, the letters of Clement, for example. Uh, why not remove the letter of James, which Martin Luther called an epistle straw? You know, why not remove 2nd and 3rd John, since there were those in the early church who doubted that it was divine revelation? Why not remove Philemon? Why not remove the Apocalypse of St. John? See, the Protestant has no mechanism on, on what to do with questions like this. They take it for granted uh, what the canon is because the Catholic Church handed it to them. That's the debt of gratitude that every Protestant owes the Catholic Church. And last point, if the Protestant tries to say that the Gospels, for example, were already accepted by the early church's inspired revelation, we say that's beautiful. That shows you the value of sacred tradition. And where there was debate or dispute, the church stepped in to make a determination.